morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to um, Brookfield Congregational Church. I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. I'm Pastor Liz. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm really glad that we can gather in this space together to be uh, in connection as we come together to worship God. Uh, each week as we come together to worship, it is um, my practice that I invite us to set our uh, intention for the experience of worship. Our intention to be present, to be as fully present as we're able to be. And that means that we invite those things that are distracting us to wait someplace else, <coughs> to put them in a box and on a shelf or to leave them in the car or whatever your practice might be, to mindfully set aside those things that might draw you away from this experience so that you can be fully present while we're here together. And that will give us the opportunity that when we meet those things again, those distractions, we will have the blessing of having been present in worship when we meet them. Because I promise you, every time, every single time I've left this space, the things I put aside are still there. They're waiting. They have not gone anywhere. But now I'm ready. So I invite you to set aside this time, set aside those distractions. Now, to be clear, that doesn't mean you have to set aside your grief. That doesn't mean you have to set aside your challenges or the things that are hard. We come as whole people to this experience of worship. And so I invite you to come and be present as you are whoever you are, because whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome here. And we hope that you feel like you can belong. Let us continue in worship together. Family of faith, one of the greatest joys of worship is that it is not a solo act. We gather together. We find joy and God in the act of connection. So we begin our worship this morning and I invite you to turn and face someone that you're close to so that they can see you and repeat after me these phrases. Welcome to worship. Welcome, Welcome to worship. worship. I am glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Surely God is in this place. Surely God is in this place. I see God in your face. I see God in your face. Let us worship together. Let us worship together.
and into your, your word, and into your relationship, and to hear your voice to joy. So as we approach your word, O oh God, we pray, do not let us pass you by. Do not allow the distractions to turn out and to get us of us. Do not let us walk down this road without you. Instead, give us the wisdom to turn and run your way. Give us the wisdom to do your wisdom, to let us see into our homes and change us. With hope and gratitude, we pray. Scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 1 through 11. Console, console my people and give them comfort, says God. Speak tenderly of Jerusalem's, to Jerusalem's heart and tell it that it is time that its time of service is ended, that its iniquity is atoned for, that it is received from Yahweh double punishment for its sin. A voice cries out, clear a path through the wilderness for Yahweh, make straight the road through the desert for our God. Let every valley be filled in, every mountain and hill be laid low, and let every cliff become a plain, and ridges become a valley. Then the glory of Yahweh will be revealed and humankind will see it. The mouth of Yahweh has spoken. A voice commands, cry out. I answer, what shall I say? 
all flesh is grass, and its beauty is like the wildflowers. The grass withers, and the flower wilts when the breath of Yahweh blows upon them. How the people are like grass, grass withers and flowers will. But the promise of our God will stand forever. Go up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Zion. Shout with a loud voice, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Shout without fear and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God, Yahweh, O Sovereign One. You come with power and rule with a strong arm. You bring your reward with you and your reparation comes before you. Like a shepherd, you feed your flock, gathering the lambs and holding them close and leading mother ewes with gentleness. Hi. <laughs> How are you? You seem so happy. Yeah. I got it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, so this year in Advent, what we're doing is we're adding a new piece to our manger scene every week. Uh, last week we added our animals. Yeah, we added sheep that say ba, and we added a cow that says moo. Yeah, yeah. And this week, and we also added a manger, which is where they eat. They eat their hay. Yeah. And this week, this doesn't actually go with our piece, but our our set doesn't have an angel, and we needed an angel. This week we're adding an angel because in every story that we listen to in our series with Luke, the voice of God comes to us through an angel. And so we have an angel, the angel Gabriel is, is over the manger to remind us that, the God, that God is with us and speaks. God is still speaking. Yeah. So that's what we're adding to our major this week. Should we say a prayer? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your voice. And we thank you for your messengers. We thank you for the way you talk to us. Help us to know joy and love that comes in you. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us join now in our prayer of confession. God of laughter, God of the open front door and family reunions, we confess that we often doubt good news. We move in this world, waiting for the other shoe to drop, waiting for life to fall apart, waiting for our humanity to get the best of us. Instead of leaning into joy, we lean into scarcity. We lean into fear. We lean into isolation. Forgive us for forgetting that joy is amplified when shared. Heal the wounds we have from past hurts and teach us how to throw open our doors like Elizabeth. Show us how to find joy in connection. Amen. Faith family. I imagine that when we come before God with the truth of our lives, God meets us like Elizabeth meets Mary in our scripture today. The door is thrown open. There is laughter. There is joy. 
there is embracing and that it is holy. So trust this, believe this. You are claimed, you are loved, you are forgiven, you are sent to serve. Find joy in that. Amen. Sometime later, Elizabeth conceived. She went into seclusion for five months, saying, Oh God has done this to me, for me. In these days, God has shown favor to us and taken away the disgrace of our having no children. Six months later, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the town of Galilee called Nazareth to a young woman named Mary who was engaged to a man named Joseph in the house of David. Upon arriving, the angel said to Mary, Rejoice, highly favored one. God is with us. Blessed are you among women. Mary was deeply troubled by these words and wondered what the angel meant. The angel went on to say to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and bear a son and will give him the name Jesus, which means deliverance. His dignity will be great, and he will be called the only begotten of God. God will give Jesus the judgment seat of David, his ancestor. to rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will never end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have never been with a man? The angel answered him, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Hence the offspring of the born will be called the Holy One of God. Know too that Elizabeth, your kinswoman, has conceived a child in her old age, and she is, who was thought to be infertile, is now in the sixth month. Nothing is impossible with God, Mary said. I am a servant of God. Let it be done unto me as you say. With that, the angel left her. Within a few days, Mary set out and hurried to the hill country, to the town of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. As soon as Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she explained, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why am I so favored that the mother of the Messiah should come to me? The moment was greeted, the moment you greeted reached my ears, and the child leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed and what our God said to her would be accomplished. God is still speaking. 
Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come, holy Yahweh, and breathe your promise of peace upon us. Make us feel your comfort as you snuggle the lamb to your chest while leading her mother gently to new feeding ground. Show us your way through the rough places. Show us your way through the valleys. Show us your way and open our hearts and minds for the experience of joy. May this be a blessing to all who experience it. Amen. Growing up when my family would begin the season of Advent, when I was young, we would do an Advent wreath at home. But also, uh, we would decorate our tree, always a fresh tree growing up. That was our tradition. Uh, my dad, as we were getting ready to start the decorating process, would put on Handel's Messiah on the record player in the other room and turn it up loud so the whole house could hear the Messiah. I honestly didn't have a great appreciation for it when I was little, <laughs> as one could imagine. It was just not my style, but it was dad's thing. So, okay, background music, fine. But I'm grateful for the indirect lesson that became a memory of comfort. I listen to Handel's Messiah now around Christmas time. I try to listen to it when we're decorating the tree, although not every year, because it wasn't my family's favorite. <laughs> but it's one of those experiences of comfort. And I have a great appreciation for it and its message now. And I can't hear this passage from Isaiah, chapter 40, without hearing that beautiful tenor solo. If you, know, if you know the piece, you know which one I'm talking about. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my God, oh, I messed it up. Um, it's there, though. Save your God, you know that part, right? Savior God, speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem. And cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her Something like that. And then a voice cries out in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert. Ah, I can't get it. A highway for a goat. Right? So it's that beautiful, and I almost got it. I got some of it anyway. But I, I just, I can't hear that without hearing that tenor. And then the next piece, right? Every valley shall be exalted. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that, I, I, can't, I, can't I can't hear the passage without hearing that music. And it is a comfort. The song, the singing, the hearing of that music is directly connected to a comfort I feel a memory of joy standing around our sweet-smelling tree with the fire in the fireplace and creamy eggnog while we hang ornaments and tinsel and garland. Me and my little sister and my parents. So many layers of comfort and joy and connection. The memory connects me to the little girl in me who celebrates Christmas with hope and excitement. Maybe I'll get the presents that I want, you know. 
but also the excitement of opening a new door each day on my advent calendar that my daddy gave me in church. Knowing that on Christmas Eve we'd light candles together and sing Silent Night together and then we'd go out to dinner together. The music connects me to my dad and the scripture which connects me to God's love. The memory also connects me to my mom who taught me how to string cranberries and popcorn so that we could make garland for our tree. I have never done that as an adult. But as a kid, it was so cool that we had like real cranberries and popcorn on our tree. I think we only did that one year. But it was a big memory, right? <laughs> I have pictures of it and I'm, I'm back there again. And my sister who was born when we lived in that house in Georgia. Come for ye. The story of Elizabeth has always been one that drew me in because my name is Elizabeth. <laughs> and my dad's name is John. So both of us have our names in the same story in the Bible. Our names are in the Bible, in the same story. It's so cool. That might be on purpose, but still, it's super cool, right? That, that our names are in the story. And as a kid, I just thought, wow, that's me right there. We're connected. But this passage has so much happening in just a few verses. Elizabeth convinced, convinces, I'm sorry, try again. Elizabeth conceives <laughs> and goes into hiding. The same angel who, sp who spoke to Zechariah last week, as we read the scripture, now visits Mary, Elizabeth's cousin, and tells her that she will also be a mother, this time of the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who is to come, the only begotten of God. And also that Elizabeth is six months pregnant already. Mary welcomes the message of blessing and then hastily takes a journey to visit Elizabeth. When Mary arrives, Elizabeth is filled with the spirit at the sound of Mary's voice and John leaps in her womb and both women rejoice. All of that in just a few 20 some verses. I wonder though about Elizabeth's hiding. Did you notice that Elizabeth? stays in seclusion for that whole six months. She finds out she's pregnant. Now, did you notice too, Zechariah gets the message from the angel. And a little while later, Elizabeth conceives. Interesting, right? So even though Zechariah can't speak, his speech has been taken from him and he no longer has a voice there's still connection happening because Elizabeth conceives. So after she conceives, Elizabeth goes into hiding. The commentators speculate that Elizabeth is hiding the shame of being an older woman who is pregnant. Well, that might be part of the story. I feel like the commentators are not people who've struggled with infertility. I wonder if she's hiding because she doesn't want to experience the joy and hope of pregnancy in front of other people again. There's nothing in scripture that alludes to Elizabeth having miscarriages, but those of us who've experienced infertility know there were miscarriages. This woman doesn't want to hope. She doesn't want to celebrate what is not yet. She's done it too many times. And she is afraid to hope. She is suppressing her joy for fear of having to mourn it again. Elizabeth is hiding. And Zechariah can't speak. So I would imagine Elizabeth is experience a whole, experiencing a whole lot of silence for six months. 
Although there is connection with Zechariah because, as I said, John comes after he has no voice. Okay. There's connection even in new ways. But I would imagine Elizabeth finds this one, this one more reason to hide from well-meaning but nosy neighbors and family. One more thing not to have to explain to everyone how she's managing with a speechless husband, how she's managing yet another pregnancy. Is this one gonna be the one? Now, while scripture makes it clear to us, Elizabeth is too old for babies, Mary is too young, right? Unmarried, people talk. There must be a level of excitement for Mary as she gets the news, but also fear of shame. And so she flees. She runs to visit Elizabeth, who is also pregnant. Now, commentators have noted that they believe Elizabeth offered shelter to Mary, right? Because Mary is afraid. She's afraid of the community around her. So Elizabeth brings her in and offers her shelter. Now, commentators of this series have wondered if Mary offered, if Mary offered Elizabeth a way out of hiding. The instant that Mary entered Elizabeth's house and opened her mouth to let out a greeting of hello, the spirit moved among them. The baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped, and we hear nothing from Zechariah, but that was expected because he has no voice. Still, I wonder what was in his mind witnessing all of this connection, this new, exciting moment of celebration, of joy, of hope. What must it have been like to be Zechariah, who saw Elizabeth have a moment of hope again, maybe for the first time in this whole pregnancy? Filled and overwhelmed by the Spirit, simply at the words of Mary, the sound of her voice. These women carrying Jesus and John the Baptist, cousins, friends, sharing what is real and scary about this moment. Sharing joy and all these beautiful connections. Mary and Elizabeth are saving one another. In my, life, in my life, I have noticed that when I'm going through big stuff, usually some of my friends, if not all of them, are going through big stuff too. <clears throat> There's some real beauty in being able to share with a friend who knows what you're going through. There's some real relief in being able to talk to somebody else who you already trust, who understands on some level, even if it's not the same big stuff, even if it's different big stuff, but who understands on some level the big stuff. It's also a challenge to balance when to lean in and when to back off, right? But I'm grateful to be able to, say, to see myself and my friends. To be able to present, to be present for one another and hold space for grief for one another. I'm grateful for memories we can share and experiences we can identify normalizing the grief experience. I'm also intimately aware of the work required to make connection through times of weariness. Last week, last week we acknowledged that we are weary. We are weary and we are living in a weary world. 
when we are weary, effort feels bigger than when we're feeling good. When we are weary and still carrying big feelings and big experiences, usually we have earned our weariness because it takes more effort, more energy to simply get through the day when we're carrying all the extra of the big stuff. Just to feel somewhat normal, whatever that word means, right? just to get the usual tasks done. It takes more of us when we are weary to get it done. It takes longer, which is frustrating, which takes more energy, it takes more of us. So even though we know we need connection when we're feeling overwhelmed, even though we know it will make us feel better to connect to someone else, to nature even, to good, friend, to good food, to God. The energy we imagine it will take to make connections just feels too big. And so sometimes, boy, you are not my friend today. <laughs> so sometimes we choose to hide instead of connect. And some of that hiding is about self-preservation and is important, but it's not sustainable. So one day at a time, we are called to find ways to connect, not always to people. Nature is good too. Spiritual connection is good too. I mentioned food, that can be a connection, right? Making sure we are nourishing our bodies, taking our medicine, drinking enough water. Because it is in our connection that we will find there is joy even in our weariness. Mary and Elizabeth were weary for different and the same reasons. Mary hid, I'm sorry, Elizabeth hid, Mary fled. And their common refuge for one another, in their common refuge, they found their joy and thus their freedom from shame and their connection to life. They didn't have to feel the shame that the rest of community was going to put on them because what had been given was a blessing. They found that in their connection to one another. When they connected, that is when they connected to life. In this season of preparing, Advent waiting, I invite us to make connections and make room for joy. One day at a time, sometimes one moment at a time, little by little. And if joy feels like too much right now, make the connection. And maybe allow someone else to hold space for your joy. Because that's what we do for each other. Amen.
as we come to you this morning, we are grateful for your blessing of connection. Let it be, let it move through us as a motivator to empathy, that we would be moved to action in the face of great suffering. Call us to be people of justice. Move us to be people of action. Invite us. Urge us to be active in the bringing of peace. We pray, O oh God, for those who are struggling in this season of Advent as we move into Christmas especially those who already are struggling with mental health or addiction issues. We pray, O oh God, that you would bring comfort, encouragement, support, healing of trauma, hope, but not, not simple hope, authentic, deep hope, a reason to keep on. God, we give you thanks for being with us and calling us to be comfort to those who are going through grief, those who are facing the end of life, those who are facing challenges in their health. We pray, oh God, that you would help us to be present, to be a vessel for your voice, or simply to be quiet and present and what is a challenge we pray also God to give that we give thanks for the joy and celebration of new opportunities and new life that is in front of us we give thanks for the opportunity to be connected to one another and to know that connection is you within us We pray, O oh God, for those who are suffering from the damage of the storms, for those who are grieving today the loss that it, bring, it brought, that they brought. We pray, O oh God, that you would encourage us to find where connection leads us to peace, to hope and to joy. And that through love we can shine your light into the world. We pray all of this in the name of your only begotten one who taught us to pray together saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We believe that joy is a sacred gift existing on a flame deeper than happiness, stemming from the truth that we belong to God. We believe that joy is not meant for isolation, but is meant to be shared, weaving us together in laughter and hope. And when joy feels impossible, out of reach, we believe that part of being a sacred community is leaning on one another. So together we say, I will share my joy with you when yours runs out. I will share your joy when mine runs out. And in so doing, we will all see God 
as stewards of joy, let us also be stewards of all the good gifts that God gives in abundance, and let us give of our gifts with gladness to fund the mission of changing lives through this ministry. Those who receive our offering, please come forward. Amen. 